I'm very delighted and honored, and actually I'm a bit emotional tonight because, as you know, uh, many years ago I came to this university. I earned actually two degrees from this university, and uh, the last time I was actually in a high table dinner was 40 years ago. <laughs> and I was sitting in economy class at the back there, <laughs> not first class here. And uh, actually, time flies by very quickly. But I, I can't even remember who was the speaker, and I can't remember what he talked about, naturally. That was 40 years ago. Anyway, um, all I remember was university was the greatest time in my life. Would you agree? No. Especially when you're in a university as good as the Hong Kong U. <laughs> hey. Wait, especially when you're in a college called Shenheng College, right? Well, um, I think uh, I, I really think university life is the best. You see, I just heard um, the master said there's no failure, there's no setback. You can't fail. Is it still true that it is more difficult to get a pass than to get a first class honor? No? Yes? Yes or no? Those who think yes, please raise your hand. It's more difficult to get a pass than to get a first class honor. Okay, I wish you would get a pass, okay? <laughs> now, uh, and then I'm told that actually you can now skip classes. It's called total freedom. At that time, when I, I, was, I take a lot of pride in skipping class and go out and had a drink until about 2 a.m. in the morning, came back, the handover was too bad, decided to skip class again the following day. But I'm told today, you don't even have to worry about that. You can actually choose classes to go to, choose a workshop you organize, and to do whatever you like. Is that true? Wow, life has really improved here. <laughs> and then obviously, it's a very safe place. Right? You have a very safe environment, and you can make a lot of mistakes, and you would even have a master to take care of you. And by the way, everybody here is nice and young and passionate and energetic, including, of course, the master. Correct? Yeah, yeah right. That sounds better. <laughs> but as you know, real life is very different. If you expected to turn up in a meeting at 8.30, you had better be there on time. If you make a lot of mess, if make a big mess out of something, of a project, a company assigned you to, you might be fired. Real life is very different. That's why all these universities ask people to come and teach people what you should learn before you step out into the business world, into the real world. And they give you a lot of big words. Curiosity, creativity, innovation, self-reflection, self-education, you name it. You heard a lot of all these words. I still wonder how some of why what what are some of these words and what do they actually mean? So I'm not going to give you any of that. I'm just thinking that I wish there would be an old guy who would come before I graduate and give me some practical tips before I step out to the real world. I never got that. I wish there could be such an old fellow. Now, 40 years later, your master has asked me to come to this high table and be that old fellow. <laughs> Am I, and I really grateful for that? Well, there's nothing very much I can really share with you uh, in 20 minutes. How can I condense my 40 years after school to 20 minutes? That's about 5 minutes every 10 years. <laughs> I mean, there's no way I can do it. So I'll just say the first important lesson that you must, you must learn. Must remember, it's a high table. <laughs> now this is the only time when we are coming in university probably that we actually dress up properly and we carry ourselves properly. That's very, very important in life. This is the time when you train yourself, carry yourself properly. It is your appearance, your manners, your etiquette. Your social skills, you talk to the people around here, your language skills, your communication skills, even your presentation skills. 
what do recruiters look for when they have 5,000 applicants? I can assure you, everybody of them, every one of those applicants has got a very good CV, very good academic grades, very good essay. By the way, I just saw people standing up earlier before dinner. How many of you would be looking for a job um, in the next two years? Right. Now, don't just count on your academic grades. Don't just count on your essay. When you go for an interview, look good. The interview will be thinking, who do I need to have confidence and pleasant and can carry the company forward in the next generation? If you look like a lump in the chair, and if you are wearing all the bling bling top brand fashion, which is totally out of place, and probably, no matter your grades, no matter your uh, other essays, you probably would not be the chosen one. So there's a reason why there is a high table, and I'm very grateful actually that universities still have this tradition of a high table. That, I think, is, is my lesson number one. But what I also learned is actually in university, because of all these things we talked about, that there is no failure, there is a lot of freedom, you can dare to make things better. Now, I didn't say dare to be different, I say dare to think things better. Being different may not make things better. But making things better is absolutely important. Why do I say that? Now, when I entered Hong Kong University, I didn't come from a very rich family, I mean, honestly, not a, not a very well-off family at all. When I entered Hong Kong University in 1974, I have never had a passport, never have been on an airplane, never been to anywhere further than Macau. Right? It sounds ridiculous. Today, a child of this height has been to Paris and Rome. When I entered this university, I have been nowhere. And I was very envious of my classmates who have been to a lot of places. This is early 70s. And I couldn't afford it. And I was thinking, how could I achieve my dreams of really seeing the world? Through my connections and, and studies, I got a license to work on a cargo boat, a bulk cargo carrier called MV Green Island, 4,000 tons only, which is extremely small, and worked in the radio office of a cargo carrier for the first summer of my time in this university. We sailed all the way to the Philippines, Manila and Iloilo and, and Tafao, and then Indonesia, and then Papua New Guinea and Australia, all the way from Brisbane to Geelong. On the way back, passed through the Philippines and Taiwan and back to Hong Kong. It was tough. It was very scary. I remember out there in the open sea one day, there was a tornado at sea. And you can see this black swirl going up the skies and drawing up all the seawater. And the seawater comes back down as rain. And the rain so heavy, it rained so heavily that you could hardly see the head of the ship. And the fish would come down from with the rain because we drew it up and it came back down, which is quite a sight. But it was very scary and it was all black and dark out there. And it was four months. The, the journey was four months and I was about three weeks late for the start of the university second year here. And I was nearly expelled from this university because of, at that time there was no email, no internet, nothing, only Morse code, but the university has got no Morse code. <laughs> and therefore, I, mean, I couldn't tell the professor, the dean, uh, at that time that I would be late. And it was very embarrassing when I came back. But actually, I have seen more places than most of my classmates. It was very tough, but it was worthwhile. And opening my eyes to see places, the first time I went to Australia and went to Papua New Guinea and all these places, opened my eyes to the world. And that's probably why, after graduation, when there's a company called Cafe Pacific offering, not a higher salary of course, a job 
um, I would be very happy ticket thinking that this is another opportunity for me to see the world. So that was really a start that I have made a university. That belief, it is always a way, there's always a solution to achieve your objectives. It may be a very different route, maybe a very unique way of doing it, but there's always a way. You just think, don't accept difficulties, don't accept challenges as they are. Oh, I'm poor, I can't afford it. Well, you don't have to buy a first class ticket, but you can actually get to where you want to go. In fact, a lot of the ideas that people credit us with, a lot of great new ideas and innovative ideas, it's just a result of not accepting the norm, not accepting defeat. We will find some way out. Let me do a survey. How many of you remember the, uh, the Cafe Pacific World's Biggest Welcome, whereby we gave away 10,000 tickets in Hong Kong? How many of you remember that? Yeah. Nobody, my goodness. <laughs> How many remember the We Love Hong Kong campaign after SARS? Nobody, okay, that's fine. How many, <laughs> okay, uh, I should try something easier now. How many of you have uh, been to uh, Halloween uh, celebration in Hong Kong? Good. Good, okay, okay. Another question. How many of you have thrown an aircraft and an ice cream on it? Eaten ice cream on an aircraft? Yeah. One more, okay. And uh, think of another example. There are quite a few. Um, how many of you actually have uh, flown on one of these midnight flights out of Hong Kong into Hong Kong? Wow, that's quite a lot of people. Okay, um, how many of you have seen the TV series Chong Shao Wan Siu, Triumph in the Sky? Wow, that's quite a lot of people. Okay, uh, I'll pick one with story because I mean, you see, I only have 20 minutes to talk about uh, 40 years of history, so. I'll just pick one of them. Shall I uh, tell you about this uh, TV series then? Uh, this is a TV series started in 2002. And uh, the idea was really how to make Cafe Pacific a more Hong Kong oriented company that people associate with. Uh, and this is a legitimacy that you need to have in your home country. From there, basically, we have figured out a lot of ideas of what to do. And one person said, if we could actually get the TV station, because Hong Kong is still very much a TV town, if we can get the TV station to produce a series, and talk about the airline, it would be great. So when we talk to the TV station, we figure out our strategy. And, the, and, and obviously, they have too many things to talk about. They have many, many ideas. But our incentive is obviously, you can fly, we can, we can ship you to one of these uh, ports, Adelaide, or Sao Paulo, or any place you like and you can actually film there. Now, how many Hong Kong's TV stations can actually have overseas filming? So they were very tempted, and there's a long story. Uh, and eventually produced the first TV series on Cafe Pacific, the first time, actually, anybody did that for an airline, at least in Hong Kong. And 10 years later, it was repeated, obviously. Now, and this story broke my heart because at that time, being a CEO of Cafe Pacific, I thought I would be quite famous. <laughs> but this brought me back to reality. Because on the day when they started the filming, they always have a ceremony. And all the TV stars came to Cafe City at that time. And my colleagues told me, why don't you come down and have a picture with all of them? I said, look, they are, they are TV artists. I, I, they don't want me to be there. No, 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 you must come because that time the general manager of TVB, uh, Mr. TK Ho, was also there. Why don't you come down and take a picture and just to recur to Mr. Ho? Sure, I'll do that. So I went down and we all lined up and we took a big picture. Every newspaper the following morning carried that picture. And the caption goes like this from left to right, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the names of these artists in Chinese, Ma Dak Zhong, Wang Yi. Chen Wei San, Wu Zhan Yu, and then Ho Ding Guan, okay, the TVB people. To me, etc. <laughs> Since then, I mean, that's probably my name. But the point is, I mean, the, these things actually make a big hit in Hong Kong. And the, kind, the idea is just think 
there is always a way to do something extra. There's always a way to do something better. Not necessarily, sometimes you have to make it different. But there's always a way. If you just put your mind to it, there's always one thing, something that you can do to make things very different and very much better. That brings me to my third point, which means that you've got to keep going and keep constant, continuous improvement. You can't just think different, think laterally. You've got to think outstandingly. And that means you've got to always improve yourself so that you can absorb what you see, so that you can absorb, uh, absorb your observations and interpret them and bring out something really outstanding. There's so many changes in this world. When I joined this university, there were only about six residential halls, I think. Nobody would imagine this area would be a residential hall. Even the United Nations, most of the member countries were not there when the United Nations was founded. So it's not just technological change. There's so many changes in this world. If you don't keep updating, if you don't keep improving yourself, you can't absorb and think of something different and outstanding. Tell me, who, who was that guy who ran there, who is still now the 100 meter record holder? What was his name? Bolt, right, okay, thanks. Now, you see, many years ago people say 100 meters, you can't run it below 10 seconds. It's just human limit. Now people broke that 10 second record. And then came Bolt, 9.64 I think it's now. Would you bet against me that there will be somebody who can break his record in, in, in time to come? There would be. The lesson really is, no matter how well you're doing, how successful you are, there is a way that you can do better. There must be. And if you don't do it, somebody else will. If you read this book by Intel's head, N.D. Grove, only the paranoid survive. Well, that's exactly what he's talking about. Mm. And to me, consistent improvement is absolutely key in life. In fact, when we look back, and I'm sure you shared that, we have done a lot of stupid things years ago. When we were much younger, we've done things really stupid. But that's all right, we learn from our own experience. But actually, it is more important to learn from other people's experience, because experience can be very expensive. Learning from other people's experience can be excellent. So I urge you to observe much more keenly, read more books, make sure that you have continuous improvement from today on for the rest of your life. My fourth and final point is there will be a lot of setbacks. I have seen a lot of challenges, although I say don't, don't, don't lie down and declare defeat. You will bound to encounter a lot of difficulties and challenges. I mean, people say you must be a celebrated position when you were CEO and, and all that, right? I finished my tour of duty in Dragon Air in 1997, and that was a tough job because Dragon Air was really tough. That was a turnaround job turning a really money-losing airline into the most profitable airline in the world. So when I joined Cafe Pacific in 1997, I thought I would start playing golf and enjoy myself, having done a really difficult job. Three weeks after I joined Cafe Pacific, we have to ground the entire A333 because of a, an engine problem. Right? The entire fleet was grounded. At 5.30 in the morning, uh, I have to make that decision, ground the entire fleet, which was very tough. And I have to call the chairman. And the chairman said, can you call me back in about three minutes? That's very odd. Why do I have to call you back in three minutes? He said, I want to make sure that I'm not in a nightmare. <laughs> so you call me back. Anyway, he immediately endorsed our decision, because safety really has to come first. And that was my first major move moment in CAFE, three weeks after joining. I don't even, even know who should I call in engineering to ask for details. And then I thought, okay, that was a big test, that's all right. And then came 1997, uh, the uh, uh, changeover, the reunification of China. 
then of course followed by the Asian financial crisis. End of that year, you probably remember, is the first bird flu Hong Kong has experienced. 1999, we have the pilot's uh, industrial dispute. Uh, and then 1990, sorry, 1998, we have the pilot's dispute starting. And then 1998, we have uh, the opening of a new airport, which was quite chaotic when it first opened. And then the industrial dispute continued in 1999. And then 2001, we have uh, 911, whereby uh, the whole travel industry fell into the deep cold winter. And then 2003, we have SARS. I still remember on May the 21st in 2003. Uh, we have one flight to Taipei, and the entire booking was one person. And at the time of departure, that person did not show up. <laughs> uh, that was 2003, and then 2005, it was uh, the, uh, the, the fuel price, the, the fuel price uh, saga. So if you think through all of that, actually, uh, it has been a lot of challenges. And I, I normally tell people, I don't, I don't actually look I'm not as old as I look, just because I work too hard. But the major problem, a major setback, major shock I had in life was about nine years ago. I uh, went for a physical checkup and everything was normal, except the doctor probably wanted a, a few more dollars from me. And he suggested me uh, to go for a heart examination. And I was early 50s and I, I, had a very, I had a very strong heart at that time and I could didn't feel any problems, but anyway, I took his advice, went for a heart uh, scan, and it came out perfectly all right, except they saw a lump in the lungs. And I was referred to a specialist, and the specialist took a look at that picture, and he said, I'm sure this is a tumor. In other words, you got cancer. And the world basically stopped. You have a lot of feelings right at that moment saying it can't be true. I have never smoked one cigarette in my life. I have had a healthy lifestyle. It couldn't be me. And why me anyway? And this is the autumn of 2007. Well, I mean, there's nothing you can do except to go through the right things that the doctors told you to do. So the doctor said, you must go for surgery. And uh, he basically chose the date because it's very difficult to book a one hosp private hospital in, uh, in Hong Kong. So he chose a date for me. That date happens to be my wedding anniversary. Anyway, so uh, I, my wife and I actually celebrated the anniversary by going to hospital. And uh, we immediately operated, and the doctor basically, I mean, the first, uh, the last thing I remember was going to, to, to the hospital room. Now, when you work, check in the hospital room, this is a very odd system in Hong Kong. Basically, you're feeling all right. But they make you change into this, you know, this hospital uniform. And when they push you to the operating theater, they don't allow you to walk there. They make you lie down in a bed, a roller bed, and they push you there. When you're being pushed, first of all, you must remember it's extremely cold in the hospital. Extremely cold. You feel very uncomfortable. And you know what you will be going through, and it's a chill in your bones. And then the worst thing I remember is when you are lying down horizontal, all you can see is a ceiling. And you're being pushed forward, the lights are disappearing one by one behind you be thinking, is this a one-way journey? Are these lights passing by me uh, a signal? And you suddenly have a lot of things to, to, to think, well, have I got anything else I can think of now? Any regrets, any major problems, anything that I haven't done, any bucket list? But, I mean, the operating theater was right in front of me. And you feel, basically, this is coming to something that you can't escape. This is the inevitable end. Fortunately, after a few hours, I mean, I was awake in my room, I uh, wake up again in my room, and uh, a, lot, a large part of my lung gone. 
and I felt a major serious pain. And you look down and you see tubes here, tubes there, and tubes everywhere. And the doctor then appeared. He said, recovery is an active process. You can't depend on just lying in bed. You've got to go, get up and be active. You've got to help yourself. No one can help you recover. And if you want to go to the toilet, the nurse will push this drip for you, but you want to walk yourself. And the toilet is about distance from that wall to here. Okay. I could not make it. Because the lung was so weak, you have to puff as you're climbing Mount uh, Everest. It was so tough. And then the pain was really, really indescribable. And when you're in bed like that, you can't help but think really what life is all about. It suddenly dawned on me that if I never open my eyes again, the world still carries on. Who cares whether you are CEO or not? There'll be somebody else to be CEO. Don't take yourself too seriously. And the world will never remember how many medals you have you have have received, what qualification you have received, what, how many books I've written. In fact, I mean, I don't think you've read any of my books anyway, right? So, so I'll send you one. Um, so really, it is really how you live to the fullness of your life. What is the best, most meaningful way and how much passion you have put into your life? That counts. Money is not a measurement of success. Reputation, frame, all that, not a reputation, not, not a measurement, not a mere measurement of success. The other thing that really dawns on me is whether you have lived up to your standards. To me, that means integrity. Integrity is not just money. It's how you have the courage to face up to all the facts, sometimes nasty facts, and face life. Never do anything wrong to your fellow man. Making sure that when you close your eyes eventually one day, and you have no major regrets, that you will revert a wrong that you've done somewhere. That to me is really how you live up to your own self. Maybe I've lost a piece of my lung, but it's very important, I think, a retreat that I am very grateful for since about nine years ago. And I think my outlook to life actually has changed quite drastically since then. The value of life really is how much passion you put into it, is how long it is. Well, my friends, you from here, you will go out, have big dreams, do wonderful things, make significant contributions to Hong Kong and the world. You will probably not remember in 40 years time who is talking here and who I am. I'll be long gone by then in 40 years time. But please do remember to think what you will be telling people when you are standing here in 40 years' time, what you would like to say. Keep up that passion and good luck.